Welcome to Application, the Typo 3 Community Podcast. One, two. Welcome to Application, the Typo 3 Community Podcast. I'm Jeffrey A. McGuire. You can call me Jam. And this is where we celebrate the Typo 3 community, sharing your stories, talking about your projects, and the difference you make in, around, and with Typo 3 CMS. Today on Application, the Typo 3 Community Podcast, I talk with Andri Steiner, the Typo 3 server team lead from Zurich, Switzerland. Andri and I have a lovely chat about his history in Typo 3 since 2002, the slow pace of change in the project in terms of consistency, upgradability, business value, and so on. Since we talked in 2020, there was no avoiding talking about hobbies and food and cooking and music along the way. I found it very interesting to talk with him about the potential future of the project as a more remote or hybrid model. Um, And as he put it, you can't do stuff offline anymore. You're forced to communicate and do everything online. And I think that we can probably get a lot out of that in the future. We get into some server team geekery. He'll tell you what sort of skills you need to bring if you want to join the server team. And in the midst of all this, we identified some communication principles that are probably valuable everywhere in life, but certainly and especially in an open source project. I hope you enjoy listening just as much as I enjoyed talking with Andri to make this episode. My name is Andri, and um, in my day job, I work at a company called Ops One. We're doing DevOps and hosting stuff. And in my spare time, I'm the leader of the Type 3 server team. Cool. And um, what sort of projects do you do at work? We just run web applications, like backends for mobile apps or usual websites or whatever our customers want us to run. Mm -hmm. And where are you based? We are based in Zurich, Switzerland. How long have you been involved with Typo3? How did you find it? I think it was back in 2002 or something like that. I can't remember how I found it. Really? You've always done it since school days? Yes, yes, yes. It was during my apprenticeship. I used to do websites in HTML Mm -hmm. and and it was just a logical step to follow. And I was very impressed with the system, especially because you were able to um, render images out of text. That's what catched my eye, because back then you did, for example, the navigation with images, because you the things like CSS weren't available. You were able to, uh, to render those things as an image and display it on the website. I remember the good old days of wrangling GIFs in tables. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so the, the early 2000s is when, when lots and lots of people were, were trying to solve this problem of, of making the web scale at all or making websites scale because copy pasting the, the menu across more and more um, HTML yes, yes, pages exactly. and it was, yeah. it was uh, exciting. So, but did you have your own CMS? Because a lot of people invented their own before they centered on something. Kind of. I just used server-side includes to put things like the menu, which you use on every site in a central file. So you Uh have to alter it on each file independently. But uh, beside of that, I just went from HTML to Typo3 back then. Did you try any other systems along the way? Yes, I think I tried like Joomla or something, but I can't remember exactly anymore. I was like, I don't know, 16 or 17 years old back then. So (laughs) (laughs) Nice. The thing that caught your attention was that you could render images from text. Do you have a first memory of using it or a first project that like, then you knew you were hooked? I think I just used it for my own website back then. And I started to do other things for customers, friends, and that's how I got involved. Right, so what version was that? It was when uh, Typo3 type was called Typo3. The name was changed from Typo, whatever version, to Typo3. I can't remember that one. Aha, wow, <laughs> that, is, uh, that is the good old days. And I guess you were there when Kaspar came with the extension framework and, and, and dropped yes. that in as well. From Then until now, what's the coolest project you've built with Typo3? 
I, I remember my very first bigger project, which I did by myself, um, still during my apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. And this was for a company who sells um, posters to put on the, your wall, like this one behind me. Right. And there you could order your poster online. And I uh, calculated, for example, the margins around the poster, which were used to put it around the, the hood. And the, the margin was displayed on the image in line in real time. And when you completed the whole process of ordering your poster, you got an invoice by PDF, by mail. And my customer who prints the poster got the letter to put to the box in PDF. And mm. this was, I don't know, back in 2003 or something. And very sophisticated for this time. Nowadays, it's no problem. And no, that's a very, very cool project. And, and fun fact, the project is still online and still running its type of tree. Really? <laughs> I don't have anything to do with it anymore, but it's still running. And I think some of the code I built back then is still in use. It's, it's got to be in there somewhere. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> wait, what's that, what's that site called? Posterkönig.ch. Nice. And it's even in typo three colors. <laughs> for people whose internet memory doesn't go back that long, for 2003, that, that's, um, that was huge. And I challenge people even now to go and, and, and create that sort of a system without all the libraries and web services and automatic you know, processing that you can buy today. My internet um, career started in about 2005, seriously, and people don't always remember how when when we were starting communities in that point open source communities and 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 writing sites there wasn't git and there certainly wasn't github and there weren't all these um, there weren't the php fig standards we had to at that time we had to sort of build everything and including the community and decide how a community would work and how contribution works and what does it mean to write a patch and you know, whoa, version control was even controversial to start with. You know, it was um, the Wild West. And when was the last time you did an FTP upload? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Because, because, that's, because that's what it was, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that is a really, really cool project. And I think it, it shows this, this claim of the, the enterprise CMS that Typo3 has had for a long time. Feels really appropriate that, that it could handle quite sophisticated functionality in a scalable, sustainable way. Um, I guess the other thing that you touched on there is there's some code of yours probably still running around in there. And I've always been quite impressed with the slow rate of careful change in Typo3 um, and how you can still upgrade from version four if you're still running one of those all the way through to version 10 right now with some careful work and it's not yeah. impossible, right? And there's not impossible mm -hmm. gaps to bridge. And the fact that at least since version six, it's been quite possible to, to do upgrades without having to rebuild everything all the time. And the back end, when, I use, when, the, when the decision was made to, to have the editor focus and make it attractive and, and functional and helpful for the people who live in it in the back end every day, you know, it stayed really recognizably consistent and now that it's responsive it still looks the same but it works like that and i i think that whole focus on sustainability is 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 really really impressive with typo 3 and i know that it helps people sell some projects here and there but um do you have any upgrade stories or long running projects that you're involved with yes well i don't do type 3 projects by myself anymore because i just uh, focus on the hosting and server part but our customers have several year or even decades long running customers, which they just update or do new stuff. And yeah, it's quite impressive. Mm. Um, I was in a type of three, I think it was four five, version four or five backend recently. And then I just realized how much work was put in between version four five and 10. It's quite, I was quite impressed because you just realize it when you look at something very old and yeah. how much the difference is. Yeah. 
And back in yeah. version 4.5 and back in those days with a lot of projects, it was all developers writing something for developers and not thinking about the people using it. And um, I think that the biggest change that that we've all undergone in, in these open source projects that are still around is actually thinking of the people who use this stuff and evolving towards yeah. making making something that's comfortable for for the authors and the, the, the actual clients. And it's, it's, it's funny to say that because I remember not being a developer and showing up and and um, people were like, what do we talk with you about? You know, why, why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> Your main contribution to Typo3 currently is running the typo3.org server team. How did you get onto yes. that team? I was just asked by a colleague who was the former team leader. It's Michael Stuckey. I was a member for, I don't know, since 2013 or something like that. And Michael just decided to step back a bit um, beginning of this year and asked me to take over. And so we just switched roles and I'm the leader now and he's a member. How big is the team? It, uh, we are five people in total. Who else is on the server team with you? Um, it's uh, Michael Stucke, I mentioned before. And then it's Bastian Bringenberg, um, Stefan Grossberns, and Andreas Beutel. Talk about what, what you do regularly for typo3.org. We are basically just running all applications behind typo3.org. It begins with the website itself, and there are about three dozen other applications like bug tracker or versioning for code management or forums or whatever service you can imagine. And usually those are open source softwares. We just take and run and update and backup and yeah, do whatever we have to do to keep the things running. And we meet uh, twice a month um, remotely and usually in normal years, unlike 2020, we meet right. four times in person somewhere in an office. What we, what we could say about um, the server team is that we're still looking for some members. Great. And we're very keen to add team, new people to our team and everyone interested in running stuff is uh, welcome to contact me. And usually we we uh, invite them to a sprint in person so we can um, get to know them. But as this is not possible at the moment, we just just we would just set up some remote call and whatsoever and yeah introduce them to the project. Um, Terrific. Yeah, as we run most of the, our applications in Docker nowadays, um, and everybody who is a bit familiar with Docker can join us and help to run and manage those things on our infrastructure. I think the nice thing about Docker containers as well is essentially I can almost I can almost practice uh, you know setting things up and and destroying them and moving them around and it's a lot less consequential than working on like the one running copy yeah. that we have. What sort of skills or experience or knowledge should um, should someone have apart from knowing something about Docker? Mostly communication skills. Uh -huh. and organization skills because it's very important to to communicate with the so-called customers like all the team members or end users of the project you have to um, maybe do support to someone who is not able to log in into an application and so you have to communicate with them in maybe english or whatever language they speak and you speak yeah you have to organize yourself a little bit because um, even if I'm team leader, I, I'm not the boss in your usual company who will stand behind you and tell you what you have to do. So we usually, as I told, uh, meet twice a month and we just discuss the pending work and share the work with each other. And then all the people go and take something and do something. You touched on something incredibly important that I hadn't that I hadn't framed in this context before. Talk about the success factor in open source of communication skills, especially organization, I think, but communication even more. Yeah, well, I think it's the key to all the, the, all the things, because if you do something and nobody knows about it, or um, you do something for someone who wants something else, or yeah, then it's 
it might be still a very good solution and uh, you have to put a lot of time and effort into it and it's technically perfect and whatsoever, but it won't be used and then it's senseless. So you have to be aware of what your customers or your friends or whatever you call them need and you have to do something which yeah, fulfills their needs and in, in such a big project as Hattery there are a lot of teams and a lot of people there are hundreds of people involved and you have to, to talk to them and there are for some projects very very uh, a big number of people involved you have you have to take into account and, for example and, we uh, and, and, we are in a constant process of streamlining our infrastructure and one of the things we like to get rid of are the old mailing lists but the mailing list is still used for some things like mm. at the moment security announcements and i cannot just drop the list altogether because the security announcements wouldn't work anymore and the security team would be not very amused about me dropping this just out of the blue. So I have to talk to them and look for another solution and define a way forward that somewhere in the future, hopefully, we can disable those mailing lists. I think you just hit on three incredibly important points. You need to proactively communicate the ideas that you've had, because if they're good ideas, that's the only way that people are going to adopt them and help you with them. And yeah. the second thing you said was, once we're communicating with other people, we have to understand their needs. So we actually have to be able to listen and think think as well as broadcasting um, our own ideas, right? And then yeah. once that's happened, uh, the last piece you described was, we have this project that nobody exactly owns, but everybody benefits from. With your idea, you have to go and build coalitions around is this the best solution? I think I need this. You think you need that. What does that really mean, right? And then get there, and that ends up being that ends up being the the secret sauce, right? The engine that actually powers making this. Yeah, exactly. And for anyone watching this in the future, we're speaking in the in October 2020, and Europe is heading towards the second wave of the pandemic, and more and more places are being locked down again, and the weather's also getting cold and rainy. How's your 2020 been, Andri? It was actually quite good, <laughs> <laughs> because I was able to catch up with a lot of things and had a lot of time to do whatever things were required to, to do, things I, I wanted to do for years. Like oh. starting to play the Schweizer early, for example. <laughs> nice. There's a. There, I had suddenly I, a lot of time at my hands to do stuff I like, and that was quite quite good. Was there some version of a lockdown in Zurich? Yes, and we are also working from home. The full company almost since March or April, something like that. My company has been remote basically all the time. And I thought that, okay, lockdown is no problem. I'm used to doing this. I can sit at my table. I can, you know, I've got my different spaces and, and that'll be fine. And I'm used to the communication style and I know how to run a meeting, but oh, the pressure this year, it's been, it's been different. We had to do things like learn how to run a workshop through a camera instead of with a with a room full of people and there's there's still a different energy that's still um we'll see how this winter goes my silver lining was that it seems like most of the western world learned how to bake this year but i actually made jams and pickles uh like crazy and i found it incredibly therapeutic to stand over the big boiling pot of whatever and burn my arms mm. and make but now i get to eat them and um you know <laughs> <laughs> profit from all of that i'm running out of uh I'm running out of fruits now that it's the fall. You, you're not alone with that problem, I yeah. can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> so you worked on your music skills. That's super cool. I also miss, I also, I think I miss conferences in the end. And I actually miss those, like the sprints and the actual getting yeah. together. And I just Absolutely. think that in Typo 3, for example, the very strong practice of of getting the teams together and of having the, the in-person events, I think that, it really helps now because there are strong relationships and you know the people you work with and you have had beer and pizza with them. And then 
we can survive a time like this. I don't think it could go on like that forever. And I think that people who can't get involved with on the on the direct level might be losing out on something in the long term. But on the other hand, do you think that learning to be a community like this could help us expand into Asia, into Africa, into Eastern Europe more? Yes, for sure. Because you you can't you just can't do stuff offline anymore and you're forced to communicate and just do everything online and this might be a chance for sure. I'm really excited about the uh, the increased activity in India. I'm really excited about the opportunities in Africa now. It's um, I think it's a great time to be presenting this this technology to people. And I'm really excited that the, about the Type of 3 mentorship program that's going on. I think there's a lot of really, really, really interesting chances right now. Why don't you tell us what is your favorite feature of Type 3? In the moment, my favorite feature is that all the things are going to composer-based um, installations. So we can just automate things in the background. And as I'm mainly a server guy, I'm also very interested in new server stuff like nowadays Kubernetes, for example. Right. Um, I'm interested in the way to go into a cloud, so-called cloud native world with Typo3, which will come for sure sooner or later. How much needs to be changed in Typo3 to make it compatible with, with that sort of a world? It's not that much anymore. Actually, if all the extensions do use the file abstraction layer appropriately, it works already quite good. Nice. So you can actually split them out as services? Yeah, well, you just can't save or store data locally anymore because the term lo local server doesn't exist anymore. It's just some container running somewhere, which you don't have really control over it. And so right. you have to make sure that all your data is stored in a meaningful manner, in a central way. And that's what the file abstraction layer can provide us. So we just configure this layer that it doesn't save data to the local file system, but to some other service instead. And all the instances running wherever they are do get their data, data from there. Same applies to the database, of course, and things like the caching layer, but yeah, then you're good to go. Right, so now it's it's mostly a matter of configuration. Yeah. For me, the fun thing about how you just explained that consequence of the file abstraction layer is that I've always been, I've, I've been explaining it to people from, from the other side of that picture, which is, take any data source and plug it into your instance. And as an end user, you have a, yeah. a file system that looks complete yeah. and normal, but it um, it can be actually stored anywhere. And it can be, some of it's from a web service and some of it's from an S3 bucket and some of it, like it, if some of it's from your hard drive and it doesn't matter. Yeah. When I first figured out what was going on with the file abstraction layer, I was terrified for the idea that um, you could basically plug a Google drive in and let a designer have that sort of access. But um, over time, the consequences of it, you know, and the proper configuration of it have really, really, have really, really impressed me. How do you see Typo3 delivering value to clients in the real world? Yes, I think that it delivers value to every client who uses it because otherwise you had to use maybe a closed source system with a lot of licensing costs or just a, a system which you could not upgrade this easy or... Mm system which might require much more resources server-wise, which would be much more expensive to run or, yeah, absolutely. What's a fun fact about Typo3 that most people wouldn't know? Maybe that it's just such a long-running project and the fact that you can update the version 3 whatever to version 10 with basically just some minor tweaks. That is a definitely a fun fact and that's definitely a uh, Yes, an unusual. I'd like to know who you think I should talk with on this thing and, and who the community should get to know better. Uh, well, I think you should talk to Michael Stuckey because he introduced me to the whole project and was kind of my mentor during all these uh -huh. years. I know him in like 15 years now and he's a good friend. Was he there when you when you started using Typo3? Yes, yeah. Uh -huh, see, so you don't remember you don't remember how you started with it, but I'm going to find out from him. I'm going to see what he has to say. Well, we just met. We just worked at the same same company, 
than uh -huh. to, from years later. But I just knew him from things like the mailing list, and I think he was the the core uh, core leader back then or something. And it was just a name which popped up everywhere. And uh -huh. me as a, a young Swiss guy was very impressed that there are other Swiss guys around who have such central roles in such a big project. Right. A lot of the Stuckis are in Switzerland. If someone knows a little bit about Docker or wants to learn a lot more and has good communication and organization skills, I have the feeling that Andri would be very happy to hear from you to grow the server team. And um, speaking also from absolute immediate knowledge, those sorts of skills that you'd learn with Andri and um, would make a huge difference to the project. If you're earlier in your career, there's a lot of really great job opportunities that come from that sort of thing too. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Zurich. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you to thank you, you for all your contribution and enthusiasm. And thanks everyone on the server team for um, keeping our background unglamorous technologies running. I really look forward to being able to meet in person sometime. But in the meantime, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Yeah, welcome. Thank you too. Thanks to the Typo3 Association for sponsoring this podcast. Thank you, B13 and Stephanie Kreutzer, for our logo. Merci beaucoup, Patrick Gaumont, Typo3 developer and musician extraordinaire, for our theme music. Thanks again to today's guest. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe in the podcast app of your choice and share Application, the Typo3 community podcast, with your friends and colleagues. If you didn't like it, please share it with your enemies. Would you like to play along and suggest a guest for the podcast? Do you have questions or comments? Reach out to us on Twitter at Typo3Podcast. You can find show notes, links, and more information in our posts on Typo3.org. Remember, open source software would not be what it is without you. Thank you all for your contributions. Thank you.